One wintry afternoon in February 1891, three men were engaged in earnest conversation in London. From that conversation were to flow consequences of the greatest importance to the British Empire and to the world as a whole. For these men were organizing a secret society that was, for more than fifty years, to be one of the most important forces in the formulation and execution of British imperial and foreign policy. The three men who were thus engaged were already well known in England. The leader was Cecil Rhodes, fabulously wealthy empire builder and the most important person in South Africa. The second was William Teestead, the most famous, and probably also the most sensational, journalist of the day. The third was Reginald Balliol Brad, later known as Lord Esher, friend and confidant of Queen Victoria, and later to be the most influential advisor of King Edward VII and King George V. The details of this important conversation will be examined later. That present we need only point out that the three drew up the plan of organization for their secret society and a list of original members. The plan of organization provided for an inner circle, to be known as the Society of the Elect, and an outer circle, to be known as the Association of Helpers. Within the Society of the Elect, the real power was to be exercised by the leader, and a junta of three. The leader was to be Rhodes, and the junta was to be Stead, Brett, and Alfred Milner. In accordance with this decision, Milner was added to the society by Stead shortly after the meeting we have described. 1. The creation of this secret society was not a matter of a moment. As we shall see, Rhodes had been planning for this event for more than 17 years. Stead had been introduced to the plan on April 4, 1889, and Brad had been told of it on February 3, 1890. Nor was the society thus funded an ephemeral thing, for, in modified form, it exists to this day. From 1891 to 1902, it was known to only a score of persons. During this period, Rhodes was leader, and Stead was the most influential member. From 1902 to 1925, Milner was leader, while Philip Kerr, Lord Lothian and Lionel Curtis were probably the most important members. From 1925 to 1940, Kerr was leader, and since his death in 1940 this role has probably been played by Robert Henry Brand now Lord Brand. During this period of almost 60 years, this society has been called by various names. During the first decade or so it was called the Secret Society of Cecil Rhodes or the Dream of Cecil Rhodes. In the second and third decades of its existence it was known as Milner's Kindergarten 1901-1910 and as the Round Table Group 1910-1920. Since 1920 it has been called by various names, depending on which phase of its activities was being examined. It has been called the Times Crowd. The Rhodes Crowd, the Chatham House Crowd, the All Souls Group, and the Clyden Set. All of these terms were more or less inadequate, because they focus attention on only part of the society or on only one of its activities.
the Milner Kindergarten and the Round Table Group. For example, were two different names for the Association of Helpers and were thus only part of the society. Since the real center of the organization, the Society of the Elect, continued to exist and recruited new members from the outer circle, as seemed necessary. Since 1920, this group has been increasingly dominated by the associates of Viscount Astor. In the 1930s, the misnamed Clyden set was closed to the center of the society, but it would be entirely unfair to believe that the connotations of superficiality and conspiracy popularly associated with the expression Clyden set are a just description of the Milner group as a whole. In fact, Viscount Astor was, relatively speaking, a late addition to the society, and the society should rather be pictured as utilizing the Astor money to further their own ideals rather than as being used for any purpose by the master of Clyden. Even the expression Rhodes Secret Society, which would be perfectly accurate in reference to the period 1891-1899, would hardly be accurate for the period after 1899. The organization was so modified and so expanded by Milner after the eclipse of Stead in 1899, and especially after the death of Rhodes in 1902, that it took on quite a different organization and character, although it continued to pursue the same goals. To avoid this difficulty, we shall generally call the organization the Rhodes Secret Society before 1901 and the Milner Group after this date, but it must be understood that both terms refer to the same organization. This organization has been able to conceal its existence quite successfully, and many of its most influential members satisfied to possess the reality rather than the appearance of power, are unknown even to close students of British history. This is the more surprising when we learn that one of the chief methods by which this group works has been through propaganda. It plotted the Jameson Raid of 1895. It caused the Boer War of 1899-1902. It set up and controls the Rhodes Trust. It created the Union of South Africa in 1906-1910. That established the South African Periodical The State in 1908. It funded the British Empire Periodical The Round Table. In 1910, and this remains the mouthpiece of the group. It has been the most powerful single influence in all souls, Balliol, and new colleges at Oxford for more than a generation. It has controlled the times for more than 50 years, with the exception of the three years 1919 to 1922, it publicized the idea of and the name British Commonwealth of Nations in the period 1908 to 1918. It was the chief influence in Lloyd George's war administration in 1917 to 1919 and dominated the British delegation to the Peace Conference of 1919. It had a great deal to do with the formation and management of the League of Nations and of the system of mandates. It funded the Royal Institute of International Affairs in 1919 and still controls it. It was one of the chief influences on British policy toward Ireland, Palestine, and India in the period 1917 to 1945. It was a very important 
influence on the policy of appeasement of Germany during the years 1920 to 1940, and it controlled and still controls, to a very considerable extent, the sources and the writing of the history of British imperial and foreign policy since the Boer War. It would be expected that a group which could number among its achievements such accomplishments as these would be a familiar subject for discussion among students of history and public affairs. In this case, the expectation is not realized, partly because of the deliberate policy of secrecy which this group has adopted partly because the group itself is not closely integrated but rather appears as a series of overlapping circles or rings partly concealed by being hidden behind formally organized groups of no obvious political significance. This group, held together, as it is, by the tenuous links of friendship personal association, and common ideals is so indefinite in its outlines especially in recent years that it is not always possible to say who is a member and who is not. Indeed, there is no sharp line of demarcation between those who are members and those who are not, since membership is possessed in varying degrees and the degree changes at different times. Sir Alfred Zmern, for example, while always close to the group, was in its inner circle only for a brief period in 1910 to 1922, thereafter slowly drifting away into the outer orbits of the group. Lord Halifax, on the other hand, while close to it from 1903, did not really become a member until after 1920. Viscount Astor, also close to the group from its first beginnings and much closer than Halifax, moved rapidly to the center of the group after 1916, and especially after 1922 and in later years became increasingly the decisive voice in the group. Although the membership of the Milner Group has slowly shifted with the passing years, the group still reflects the characteristics of its chief leader and, through him, the ideological orientation of Balliol in the 1870s, Although the group did not actually come into existence until 1891, its history covers a much longer period, since its origins go back to about 1873. This history can be divided into four periods, of which the first, from 1873 to 1891, could be called the preparatory period and centers about the figures of W. T. Stead and Alfred Milner. The second period, from 1891 to 1901, could be called the Rhodes period, although Stead was a chief figure for most of it. The third period, from 1901 to 1922, could be called the New College period and centers about Alfred Milner. The fourth period, from about 1922 to the present, could be called the All Souls period and centers about Lord Lothian, Lord Brand, and Lionel Curtis. During these four periods, the group grew steadily in power and influence until about 1939, it was badly split on the policy of appeasement after March 16, 1939, and received a rude jolt from the general election of 1945. Until 1939, however, the expansion in power of the group was fairly consistent. 
This growth was based on the possession by its members of ability, social connections, and wealth. It is not possible to distinguish the relationship of these three qualities, the not uncommon situation in England. Milner was able to dominate this group because he became the focus or rather the intersection point of three influences. These we shall call the Toynbee Group, the Cecil Block, and the Rhodes Secret Society. The Toynbee Group was a group of political intellectuals formed at Balliol about 1873 and dominated by Arnold Toynbee and Milner himself. It was really the group of Milner's personal friends. The Cecil Bloc was a nexus of political and social power formed by Lord Salisbury and extending from the great sphere of politics into the field of education and publicity. In the field of education, its influence was chiefly visible at Eton and Harrow and at All Souls College, Oxford. In the field of publicity, its influence was chiefly visible in the Quarterly Review and the Times. The Rhodes Secret Society was a group of Imperial Federalists, formed in the period after 1889 and using the economic resources of South Africa to extend and perpetuate the British Empire. It is doubtful if Milner could have formed his group without assistance from all three of these sources. The Toynbee group gave him the ideology and the personal loyalties which he needed. The Cecil Bloc gave him the political influence without which his ideas could easily have died in the seed and the Rhodes Secret Society gave him the economic resources which made it possible for him to create his own group independent of the Cecil Bloc. By 1902, when the leadership of the Cecil Bloc had fallen from the masterful grasp of Lord Salisbury into the rather indifferent hands of Arthur Balfour, and Rhodes had died, Leaving Milner as the chief controller of his vast estate, the Milner Group was already established and had a most hopeful future. The long period of liberal government which began in 1906 cast a temporary cloud over that future, but by 1916 the Milner Group had made its entrance into the citadel of political power and for the next 20, three years steadily extended its influence until, by 1938, it was the most potent political force in Britain. The original members of the Milner Group came from well-to-do, upper-class frequently titled families. At Oxford they demonstrated intellectual ability and laid the basis for the group. In later years they added to their titles and financial resources, obtaining these partly by inheritance and partly by ability to tap new sources of titles and money. At first their family fortunes may have been adequate to their ambitions, but in time these were supplemented by access to the funds in the foundation of all souls, the Rhodes Trust and the Bight Trust, the fortune of Sir Aid Bailey, the Astor Fortune, certain powerful British banks of which the chief was Lazard Brothers and Company and, in recent years, the Nuffield money. Although the outlines of the Milner Group existed long before 1891, the group did not take full form until after that date. Earlier 
Milner and Stead had become part of a group of neo-imperialists who justified the British Empire's existence on moral rather than on economic or political grounds and who sought to make this justification the reality by advocating self-government and federation within the empire. This group formed at Oxford in the early 1870s and was extended in the early 1880s. At Balliol it included Milner, Arnold Toynbee, Thomas Rawley, Michael Glazebrook, Philip Lyttelton Gell, and George R. Parkin. Toynbee was Milner's closest friend. After his early death in 1883, Milner was active in establishing Toynbee Hall, a settlement house in London, in his memory. Milner was chairman of the governing board of this establishment from 1911 to his death in 1925. In 1931 plagues both Toynbee and Milner were unveiled there by members of the Milner group. In 1894 Milner delivered a eulogy of his dead friend at Toynbee Hall and published it the next year as Arnold Toynbee, A Reminiscence. He also wrote the sketch of Toynbee in the Dictionary of National Biographies. The connection is important because it undoubtedly gave Toynbee's nephew, Arnold J. Toynbee, his entree into government service in 1915 and into the Royal Institute of International Affairs after the war. George R. Park in later Sir George, 1846 to 1922 was a Canadian who spent only one year in England before 1889. But during the year 1873 to 1874 he was a member of Melner's circle at Balliol and became known as a fanatical supporter of Imperial Federation. As a result of this, he became the charter member of the Canadian branch of the Imperial Federation League in 1885 and was sent, four years later, to New Zealand and Australia by the League to try to build up imperial sentiment. On his return, he toured around England, giving speeches to the same purpose. This brought him into close contact with the Cecil Block, especially Georgie Buckle of the Times, G. W. Prothero, J. R. C. Lee, Lord Rosemary, Sir Thomas later on Lord Brassey, and Milner. For Buckle, and in support of the Canadian Pacific Railway, he made a survey of the resources and problems of Canada in 1892. This was published by Macmillan under the title The Great Dominion the following year. On a subsidy from Brassey and Roseberry he wrote and published his best-known book, Imperial Federation, in 1892. This kind of work as a propagandist for the Cecil Bloc did not provide a very adequate living. So on April 24, 1893 Milner offered to form a group of imperialists who would finance this work of Parkins on a more stable basis. Accordingly, Parkin, Milner, and Brassey, on June 1, 1893, signed the contract by which Parkin was to be paid £450 a year for three years. During this period he was to propagandize as he saw fit for imperial solidarity. As a result of this agreement, Parkin began a steady correspondence with Milner, which continued for the rest of his life. When the Imperial Federation League dissolved in 1894, 
Parkin became one of a group of propagandists known as the C. Lee Lecturers after Professor J. R. C. Lee of Cambridge University, the famous imperialist. Parkin still found his income insufficient. However, although it was being supplemented from various sources, chiefly the Times. In 1894 he went to the Colonial Conference at Ottawa as special correspondent of the Times. The following year, when he was offered the position of Principal of Upper Canada College, Toronto, he consulted with Buckle and Moberly Bell, the editors of the Times hoping to get a full-time position on the Times. There was none vacant, so he accepted the academic post in Toronto, combining with it the position of Canadian correspondent of the Times. This relationship with the Times continued even after he became organizing secretary of the Rhodes Trust in 1902 in 1908, for example, he was the Times' best correspondent at the Quebecter Centenary Celebration. Later, in behalf of the Times and with the permission of Marconi, he sent the first press despatch ever transmitted across the Atlantic Ocean by radio. In 1902, Parkin became the first secretary of the Rhodes Trust, and he assisted Milner in the next 20 years in setting up the methods by which the Rhodes Scholars would be chosen. To this day, more than a quarter century after his death, his influence is still potent in the Milner Group in Canada. His son-in-law, Vincent Massey, and his namesake, George Parkin D.T. Glazebrook, are the leaders of the Milner Group in the Dominion. To another member of this Balliol Group of 1875 was Thomas Rawley later Sir Thomas, 1850-1922, close friend of Parkin and Milner. Fellow of All Souls 1876-1922. Later Registrar of the Privy Council 18,961,899, Legal Member of the Council of the Viceroy of India 1899-1904, and Member of the Council of India in London 19,091,913, Raleigh's friendship with Milner was not based only on association at Balliol, for he had lived in Milner's house in Tübingen, Germany, when they were both studying there before 1868. Another student, who stayed only briefly at Balliol but remained as Milner's intimate friend for the rest of his life was Philip Lyttelton Gell 1852-1926. Gell was a close friend of Milner's mother's family and had been with Milner at King's College, London, before they both came up to Balliol. In fact, it is extremely likely that it was because of Gell, two years his senior that Milner transferred to Balliol from London. Gell was made first chairman of Point B Hall by Milner when it was opened in 1884, and held that post for 12 years. He was still chairman of it when Milner delivered his eulogy of Point B there in 1894. In 1899 Milner made Gell the director of the British South Africa Company, a position he held for 26 years three of them as president. Another intimate friend, with whom Milner spent most of his college vacations 
with Michael Glazebrook 1853-1926. Glazebrook was the heir of Toynbee in the religious field, as Milner was in the political field. He became headmaster of Clifton College 1891-1905 and canon of Ely 1905-1926 and frequently got into a conflict with his ecclesiastical superiors because of his liberal views. This occurred in its most acute form after his publication of The Faith of a Modern Churchman in 1918. His younger brother, Arthur James Glazebrook, was the founder and chief leader of the Canadian branch of the Milner Group until succeeded by Massey about 1935. While Milner was at Balliol, Cecil Rhodes was at Oriel, George E. Buckle was at New College, and A. C. Edger was at Corpus. It is not clear if Melkner knew these young men at the time, but all three played roles in the Milkner group later. Among his contemporaries at Balliol itself, we should list nine names, six of whom were later Fellows of All Souls, H. H. Asquith, St. John Broderick, Charles Firth, W. P. Kerb, Charles Lucas, Robert Mowbray, Roland E. Prothero, A. L. Smith, and Charles A. Whitmore. Six of these later received titles from a grateful government, and all of them enter into any history of the Milner group. The Milner's own little circle at Balliol, the dominant position was held by Toynbee. In spite of his early death in 1883, Point B's ideas and outlook continue to influence the Milner group to the present day. As Milner said in 1894, there are many men now active in public life, and some whose best work is probably yet to come, who are simply working out ideas inspired by him. As to Toynbee's influence on Milner himself, the latter, speaking of his first meeting with Toynbee in 1873, said 21 years later, I feel at once under his spell and have always remained under it. No one who is ignorant of the existence of the Milner group can possibly see the truth of these quotations, and as a result, the thousands of persons who have read these statements in the introduction to Toynbee's famous lectures on the Industrial Revolution have been vaguely puzzled by Milner's insistence on the importance of a man who died at such an early age and so long ago. Most readers have merely dismissed the statements as sentimentality inspired by personal attachment, although it should be clear that Alfred Milner was about the last person in the world to display sentimentality or even sentiment. Among the ideas of Point B which influence the Milner crew we should mention three they a conviction that the history of the British Empire represents the unfolding of a great moral idea, the idea of freedom, and that the unity of the empire could best be preserved by the cement of this idea be a conviction that the first call on the attention of any man should be a sense of duty and obligation to serve the state and see a feeling of the necessity to do social service work especially educational work among the working classes of English society. Three these ideas were accepted by most of the men whose names we have already mentioned and became dominant principles of the Milner group later. Point B can also be regarded as the founder of the method used by the group later.
especially in the round table groups and in the Royal Institute of International Affairs. As described by Benjamin Jowett, Master of Balliol, in his preface to the 1884 edition of Toynbee's Lectures on the Industrial Revolution, this method was as follows. He would gather his friends around him. They would form an organization. They would work on quietly for a time, some at Oxford, some in London. They would prepare themselves in different parts of the subject until they were ready to strike in public. In a prefatory note to this same edition, Toynbee's widow wrote, the whole has been revised by the friend who shared my husband's entire intellectual life, Mr. Alfred Milner, without whose help the volume would have been far more imperfect than it is, but whose friendship was too close and tender to allow now of a word of thanks. After Milner published his reminiscence of Arnold Toynbee, it was reprinted in subsequent editions of the Industrial Revolution as a memoir, replacing Chalitz. After leaving Oxford in 1877, Milner studied law for several years but continued to remain in close contact with his friends through a club organized by Toynbee. This group which met at the Temple in London as well as at Oxford, worked closely with the famous social reformer and curate of St. Jude's, White Capel, Samuel A. Barnett. The group lectured to working-class audiences in White Capel, Milner giving a course of speeches on the state and the duties of rulers in 1880 and another on socialism in 1882. The latter series was published in the National Review in 1931 by Lady Milner. In this group of Toynbee's was Albert Gray later Earl Gray, 1851-1917, who became an ardent advocate of Imperial Federation later a loyal supporter of Milner's. As we shall see, he remained a member of the Milner group until his death. Another member of the group, Ernest P. Wan Muller, had been at King's College, London, with Milner and Gell, and at New College while Milner was at Balliol. A close friend of Milner's. He became a journalist, was with Milner in South Africa during the Boer War, and wrote a valuable work on this experience called Lord Milner in South Africa 1903. Milner reciprocated by writing his sketch in the Dictionary of National Biography when he died in 1910. At the end of 1881 Milner determined to abandon the law and devote himself to work of more social benefit. On December 16 he wrote in his fiery, One cannot have everything. I am a poor man and must choose between public usefulness and private happiness. I choose the former, or rather, I choose to strive for it. For the opportunity to carry out this purpose came to him through his social work with Barnett. For it was by this connection that he met George J. Later Lord Goschen, Member of Parliament and Director of the Bank of England, who in the space of three years 1880-1883 refused to the posts of Viceroy of India, Secretary of State for War, and Speaker of the House of Commons. Goschen became, as we shall see, one of the instruments by which Milner obtained political influence. 
for one year 1884 to 1885 Milner served as Goschen's private secretary, leaving the post only because he stood for Parliament himself in 1885. It was probably as a result of Goschen's influence that Milner entered journalism, beginning to write for the Paul Mall Gazette in 1881. On this paper he established a number of personal relationships of later significance. At the time, the editor was John Morley, with William T. Stead as assistant. Stead was assistant editor in 1880-1883, and editor in 1883-1890. In the last year, he founded the Review of Reviews, an ardent imperialist, at the same time that he was a violent reformer in domestic matters. He was one of the strongest champions in England of Cecil Rhodes. He introduced Albert Gray to Rhodes and, as a result, Gray became one of the original directors of the British South Africa Company when it was established by Royal Charter in 1889. Gray became administrator of Rhodesia when Dr. Jameson was forced to resign from that post in 1896 as an aftermath of his famous raid into the Transvaal. He was Governor General of Canada in 1904 to 191 1 and unveiled the Rhodes Memorial in South Africa in 1912. The Liberal member of the House of Commons from 1880 to 1886. He was defeated as a Unionist in the latter year. In 1894 he entered the House of Lords as the 4th Earl Grey, having inherited the title and 17,600 acres from an uncle. Throughout this period he was close to Milner and later was very useful in providing practical experience for various members of the Milner group. His son, the future 5th Earl Grey, married the daughter of the second Earl of Selborne, a member of the Milner Group. During the period in which Milner was working with the Paul Mall Gazette he became associated with three persons of some importance later. One of these was Edward T. Cook later Sir Edward, 1857-1919 who became a member of the Toynbee Milner Circle in 1879 while still an undergraduate at New College. Milner had become a fellow of New College in 1878 and held the appointment until he was elected Chancellor of the University in 1925. With Edward Cook he began a practice which he was to repeat many times in his life later. That is, as fellow of New College, he became familiar with undergraduates whom he later placed in positions of opportunity and responsibility to test their abilities. Cook was made secretary of the London Society for the Extension of University Teaching 1882 and invited to contribute to the Paul Mall Gazette. He succeeded Milner as assistant editor to Stead in 1885 and succeeded Stead as editor in 1890. He resigned as editor in 1892 when Waldorf Astor bought the Gazette, and founded the new Westminster Gazette, of which he was editor for three years 1893-1896. Subsequently editor of the Daily News for five years 1896-1901. to He lost this post because of the proprietor's objections to his unqualified support of Rhodes, Milner, and the Boer War 1899-1900.
During the rest of his life 1901-1919 he was leader writer for the Daily Chronicle, edited Ruskin's works in 38 volumes, wrote the standard biography of Ruskin and a life of John Bailey, the great editor of the Times. Also associated with Milner in this period was Edmund Garrett 1865-1907, who was Stebbs and Cook's assistant on the Paul Mall Gazette for several years 1887-1892 and went with Cook to the Westminster Gazette 1893-1895. In 1889 he was sent by Stebb to South Africa for his health and became a great friend of Cecil Rhodes. He wrote a series of articles for the Gazette, which were published in book form in 1891 as in Afrikanderland and the Land of Fear. He returned to South Africa in 1895 as editor of the Cape Times, the most important English-language paper in South Africa. Both as editor 1895-1900 and later as a member of the Cape Parliament 1898-1902, he strongly supported Rhodes and Milner and warmly advocated the union of all South Africa. His health broke down completely in 1900, but he wrote a character analysis of Rhodes for the Contemporary Review June 1902 and a chapter called Rhodes and Milner for the Empire and the Century 1905. Edward Cook wrote a full biography of Garrett in 1909, while Milner wrote Garrett's sketch in the Dictionary of National Biography, pointing out as his chief title to remembrance his advocacy of a united South Africa absolutely autonomous in its own affairs but remaining part of the British Empire. During the period in which he was assistant editor of the Gazette, Milner had as roommate Henry Birchie New later Sir Henry, 1853-1937. Birchie New went into the silk manufacturing business, but his chief opportunities for fame came from his contacts with Milner. In 1903 he was made Special British Trade Commissioner to South Africa. In 1906 a member of the Royal Commission on Shipping brings a controversial South African subject. In 1905 the director of the British South Africa Company President in 1925, and in 1920 the trustee of the Bight Fund. During the First World War, he was a member of various governmental committees concerned with subjects in which Milner was especially interested. He was chairman of the Board of Trades Committee on Textiles after the war, chairman of the Royal Commission of Paper, chairman of the Committee on Cotton Growing in the Empire and chairman of the advisory council to the Ministry of Reconstruction. In 1885, as a result of his contact with such famous liberals as Costin, Morley, and Stead, and at the direct invitation of Michael Glazebrook, Milner stood for Parliament but was defeated. In the following year he supported the Unionists in the critical election on Home Rule for Ireland and acted as head of the Literature Committee of the new party. Goschen made him his private secretary when he became Chancellor of the Exchequer in Lord Salisbury's government in 1887. The two men were similar in many ways. Both had been educated in Germany, and both had mathematical minds. It was Gostin influence which gave Milner the opportunity to form the Milner Group.
because it was Gostin who introduced him to the Searful block. While Milner was Gostin's private secretary, his parliamentary private secretary was Sir Robert Mowbray, an older contemporary of Milner's at Balliol and a fellow of All Souls for four to six years 1873 to 1919. As a result of Gostin's influence, Milner was appointed successively under Secretary of Finance in Egypt 1887 to 1892, Chairman of the Board of Inland Revenue 1892 to 1897, and High Commissioner to South Africa 1897 to 1905. With the last position he combined several other posts, notably Governor of the Cape of Good Hope 1897-1901 and Governor of the Transvaal and the Orange River Colony 1901-1905. But Gostin's influence on Milner was greater than this, both in specific matters and in general. Specifically, as Chancellor of Oxford University in succession to Lord Salisbury 1903-1907 and as an intimate friend of the Warden of All Souls, Sir William Hansen, Gostin became one of the instruments by which the Milner crew merged with All Souls. But more important than this, Gostin introduced Milner in the period 1886-1905, into that extraordinary circle which rotated about the Cecil family, 